Now, so it is five o'clock and we'll get started. Uh, my name is Jamil Jaffer and I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. Uh, we are thrilled today uh, to have a true American hero, uh, Secretary Leon Panetta. Secretary Panetta was the 23rd Secretary of Defense serving from July 2011 to February 2013. Prior to joining DOD, Secretary Panetta served as CIA director from February 2009 to June 2011, where he led the U.S.'s premier all-source collection and analysis agency. During his time as, as CIA director, of course, Secretary Panetta directed the operation that led to the killing of Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan. He also served in the Clinton administration as chief of staff to the president, as director of the Office of Management and Budget, and served in, in Congress uh, for over a decade as the congressman Cal from California's then 16th congressional district, my home state of California. Um, and he served it for two terms as chairman of the House Budget Committee. I didn't know, but Secretary Panetta told me earlier today that he had also served as a young staffer on Capitol Hill. But he also served, perhaps most importantly, as an Army Intelligence Officer, where he received the Army Commend Commendation Medal. Today, Secretary Panetta directs, co-directs the Leon and Sylvia Panetta Institute for Public Policy at Cal State Monterey Bay. I've had the opportunity to go out and speak to his uh, amazing students out there, where he, uh, where his organization really instills the values and virtue of public service to young people. So it's been an honor uh, to, to, to talk to your students. Secretary Panetta, it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, I know that we have a great audience here to hear from you. So um, if it's all right by you, sir, I, we could just jump right in. Uh, I look forward to it. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I want to pay tribute to uh, uh, the National Security Institute uh, that you hit uh, and to George Mason University. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do a lot with uh, with them uh, in the time that I've been in Washington. Uh, so it's uh, it's great to have this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Well, wonderful. Well, you know, Secretary, uh, one of the challenges, you know, we've had a crazy year this year, you know, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, heated and hotly contested election, uh, and in, an actual insurrection at the Capitol. I mean, something that I, I think is almost unimaginable, the idea that thousands of Americans attack the U.S. Capitol, uh, threatening to potentially kill the Vice President of the United States, members of Congress, uh, you know, detain them, seize the, the, the votes of the Electoral College. Um, and that doesn't even count massive cyber hacking by the Russians that we learned about late last year, uh, exchanges of missile strikes in Iraq between us and the Iranians. Uh, in the last weeks alone, we've seen uh, the revelation of another massive hacking effort, this time by the Chinese, attacks on Saudi joint oil facilities by Iranian drones, changed election rules in Hong Kong, continuing violence in Burma as the coup government seeks to maintain control. And, that, and it, it almost feels like a bad late night TV sales pitch. And that's not, that's not all, you know. Um, but we do have a new administration in place. Uh, we have a new Congress. The Biden administration is now firmly there. Um, how do you see the key ne near-term threats facing our nation? What, what are the big threats facing the nation? What should, if you were advising the president today, what would you tell him to be looking out for, talking to Jake Sullivan? What should they be thinking about right now as they look ahead uh, to the next six months, year, two years? Well, you, you've obviously uh, summarized a lot of the challenges we've seen. I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that uh, the last year we've been through is the year from hell uh, in the United States uh, with all of the uh, challenges from uh, a pandemic uh, and its impact, uh, recession, uh, the impact on uh, Racial inequality has been heightened as a result of that. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, wildfires in California and hurricanes uh, back east and other storms. And, uh, and we've seen a lot of polarization that resulted in uh, that tragic event of having a mob attack the United States Capitol and actually bring our democracy to a halt. So uh, we've, we've seen a, a lot of terrible events and, and yet, uh, it's important not to lose sight of what's happening in the rest of the world uh, and the national security threats that are still there. Uh, look, I, I think the most important thing is that uh, President Biden has made clear that uh, the United States has a leadership role in the world. Uh, I think that's extremely important to begin there. Uh, because, uh, unfortunately, I think there was a sense that we were gradually withdrawing from our role in the rest of the world. Uh, we were re retreating into kind of a, 
uh, almost an isolationist kind of uh, syndrome here. Uh, and it sent terrible signals to our allies. It sent terrible signals to our adversaries. Right. Uh, and I think weakened our position generally. So number one, it's important to assert that the United States uh, is a world leader and that we have a role to play in the rest of the world. And secondly, that we have to strengthen uh, and support our alliances. Because uh, when you consider all of the danger points that are out there, it's absolutely critical that the United States build strong alliances, not just in NATO, in the Middle East, in Asia, right. in Latin America, in Africa. I mean, there, we need to have the support of other allies if we're going to confront these issues. As to the flashpoints that are out there uh, that are dangerous, I mean, in some ways, I've, I've never seen as many flashpoints uh, as we're facing since the end of World War II. Uh, right. We're still, you know, we can't forget we're still dealing with terrorism. We're still dealing with ISIS uh, and a movement that uh, is not going to stop uh, their continued effort to try to attack our country uh, and attack other Western countries as well. That's, that's at, you know, number one in, in terms of, of the kind of threat that we've got to uh, make sure we, we, we deal with. There, right. there are failed states in the Middle East, uh, and they're becoming the breeding grounds for even further terrorism, whether it's Syria or Libya or Yemen or what have you. Uh, we have Iran still representing a real threat through the uh, security of right. the Middle East uh, and undermining uh, security in that region. Uh, North Korea uh, continuing to build additional nuclear weapons a threat not just to South Korea, but to the United States as well. Right. Russia, new chapter in the Cold War with Putin. Uh, we just got an intelligence report that Putin clearly was again involved in the 2020 election, plus the kind of cyber attacks that you pointed out that Russia has been engaged in. And then obviously probably one of the principal threats uh, that we're confronting today is China, uh, because China too is making use of the opportunity, the vacuum left by the United States, they are trying to assert their influence economically, militarily, right. uh, and in other ways uh, to try to uh, expand their influence in the world, expand their influence. That's basically what China uh, is trying to do. Uh, and at the same time, uh, build up their military uh, and uh, they're obviously aggressive with regards to the islands in the South China Sea. Right. Uh, we're concerned about uh, what's happening in Hong Kong, Taiwan, the threat to Taiwan. So China represents a, a primary threat as well. And then, you know, you pointed out a, a number of other areas. Uh, cyber is an additional a battlefield that we are dealing with now. I mean, I, I have often said that cyber is the battlefield of the future, and it's proving right. to be that case right now. And frankly, I'm not sure we are as prepared to deal with the threat from cyber attacks as we should be. Uh, and you can see it from the success of the attacks that have taken place in this country. So I think it's extremely important if the United States is to be a world leader, we have got to work with our allies to develop the defenses and develop our national security to be able to deal with our adversaries throughout the world. Right. Well, look, I mean, Mr. Secretary, I, I agree with you 100% on every threat that you named there, and, and in particular, the concerns that you have on cyber and on China. Um, and I wanted you to dive deep into those here in just a second, but I want to come back to something you started with, right, which is this, uh, the point about terrorism and the fact that we are still fighting a war on terror. We still need to be fighting that war because the enemy hasn't stopped. ISIS is still out there. Al-Qaeda is still out there. There are a lot of folks, though, I think, who feel like, you know, 20-some years on, um, into this conflict, nearly 20 years, um, that uh, the time has come. And, you know, you hear uh, groups out there that are funded by wealthy uh, people on both sides of the aisle uh, that say we need to end all endless wars. You know, uh, you know, we've heard members of Congress say that they uh, haven't conducted enough oversight and that they ought to perhaps, you know, introduce resolutions to repeal the 9-11 AUMF. And, and the president has indicated he might be interested in working with members of Congress to get the right authorities in place, not, not to necessarily end the conflict, but uh, but to fight it in a different way. How do, what is the right way for the American people to think about this quote unquote endless wars concept? Um, and if the, if the conflict is to continue as, as, you've, as you've suggested, how do we fight it 
in an era where the American people are weary of, of you know, foreign conflicts? Look, I, I think the best way to think about this uh, is, is not in, in the context of, of endless wars, uh, you know, although I, I understand the argument. Uh, I think you've got to think about it in the context of America's national security. All Americans have to be concerned about protecting our national security. Uh, as director of the CIA and the Secretary of Defense, I felt my primary mission was to protect our country and to protect the American people. Uh, and the reality is, uh, you know, what happened on 9-11 was an attack on the United States of America, uh, killing almost 3,000 uh, innocent people uh, in that attack. Uh, and what it, what it represented is a real wake-up call to the United States that there are terrorists, foreign terrorists out there uh, that are prepared to attack our own country and kill our own people. Uh, and that as a result of that, uh, we had to go to war against, uh, against those terrorists. We had to go to war to make sure that 9-11 would not happen again. Right. That was important to do. Uh, and we did that. We did that. Uh, and, you know, I, I understand the concern about, you know, uh, are we in fact uh, defeating terrorism? Are we, uh, are we moving to try to achieve uh, some degree of, of control over this threat uh, from ISIS and from Al Qaeda and from others? Uh, but the answer is that if we want to keep the American people safe, we have to pay attention to those threats. Right. And, you know, the debate on Afghanistan kind of crystallizes this issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I realize, I, and you could probably uh, spend a lot of time talking about the mistakes that have been made in terms of how we've approached uh, Afghanistan and how we've dealt with that issue. Uh, but we are, in, we, we are in Afghanistan because the Taliban created a base of operations in Afghanistan right. from which they attacked the United States of America. Right. That's why we're in Afghanistan. Uh, and what we have done uh, in this period is not only uh, gone after al-Qaeda leadership successfully, I might say, yeah. uh, but at the same time, we have tried to develop in Afghanistan a country that can both govern and secure itself. It has to be, that has to be done. Uh, and is it pretty? It's not always pretty. Uh, has it been done effectively? Not always, but we have made advances uh, in Afghanistan in terms of the country, in terms of schooling, in terms of education, in terms of their ability to try to pull these tribes that exist throughout Afghanistan together uh, into some kind of unified governing system for the right. country. But more importantly, uh, we have also worked with the Afghans to try to uh, confront terrorism uh, in Afghanistan uh, by going after terrorists and by conducting operations against terrorists. Right. If the United States uh, cuts a deal with the Taliban in which the Taliban can ultimately regain control of Afghanistan. Right. Make no mistake about it, the Taliban will establish a base of operations for terrorism. Once again. And we will have to, we will, whether you like it or not, we will have to go back and confront them. The same way we had to go right. back and confront ISIS. In Iraq. Uh, as a result of leaving Iraq, ISIS uh, came together and invaded Iraq. We had to go back in and deal with it. And, and so, you know, rather than make that mistake, uh, if it requires that we maintain, uh, you know, 2,500 or 3,000 troops uh, in Afghanistan, in order to continue to put pressure on Afghanistan, in order to continue to put pressure on the Taliban, uh, in order to continue to move in the right direction there, uh, then I think we need to do that. Why? Because of our national security. That's why. Well, I mean, this, this is exactly it. And yet and yet we see so often, you know, leaders, both parties, you know, making the same mistake over and over. Right. Uh, thinking that if we if we 
if we don't fight the war there, you know, that it won't come to our shores. Um, you know, as you as you rightly point out, we didn't choose the 9-11 attacks. We didn't choose the war in Afghanistan, right? You could debate whether we chose the war in Iraq, but having having engaged in that and then having left it precipitously, right? We saw the price that, that was exacted. We were right back in there. Um, and and so, it, but it, it, it's painful to watch, you know, members of Congress and then people in the Office of Presidency, you know, make the same mistake over and over again. Um, so look, I, I mentioned now, so we talked about some of these near-term threats, but I want to have some of these bigger threats you talked about, these longer-term challenges. Um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned China as an enduring challenge, and you mentioned cybersecurity. Um, I do cyber in my day job, uh, which, isn't, which isn't unfortunately at NSI, uh, but I'd love, to, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about cyber. You know, you perhaps mo most eloquently uh, said it uh, when you were Secretary of Defense in 2012, that it is the mission and role of the Department of Defense to defend the nation's cyberspace, right? Here we are, you know, some eight, nine years later after you said those words. Um, does the Department of Defense defend the nation's cyberspace? And if not, why not? Is it not, does it not have the authorities? Is it not adequately resourced to do it? Is it, is it, is it, is there something larger about the, the, the American people don't want the Department of Defense defend, the, defend our, our cyberspace? What, what, is, what, is, what is the current state as you see it and, and why are we here? Uh, you know, I, I just think in one word, it's haphazard. Uh, I, I think it's a kind of hit and miss operation uh, to try to confront uh, uh, all of these threats that we face uh, in cyber. I remember when I became uh, director of CIA, uh, you know, I was told when I asked about uh, uh, cyber attacks, they said the CIA is getting 100,000 attacks a day, 100,000 attacks a day, uh, trying to penetrate our systems there. Uh, and what we had to do was we had to develop a, a very tough defense system to make sure that that did not happen. I'm sure the number of attacks has probably grown uh, since then. Uh, and the same thing was true with the Department of Defense. Uh, and in the security area, both with regards to DOD as well as our intelligence agencies, you know, I, I am confident that they have developed uh, good defense systems to try to deal uh, with the potential for cyber attacks. But what I, what I saw then and what I see today is the failure to develop a comprehensive national strategy dealing with cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. And with, that involves not just the security agencies, but involves our civilian agencies as well, Homeland Security, right. uh, as well as others. But what I saw even at that time was a number of very stovepiped efforts to mm -hmm. try to develop their own approach. Uh, and even the White House, uh, which had a cyber czar at that point, uh, the cyber czar did not perform the role of really controlling strategy and trying to pull it together so that everybody was following the same standards, was working together, uh, was sharing information. And the same thing is true with the private sector. Private sector, everybody's kind of doing their own thing in the private sector. Uh, they're all, you know, trying to employ whatever they can to protect their security in terms of uh, cyber, but they're hesitant to share information on those attacks. And that's a problem. If yeah. we don't get information about the kind of attacks that are coming in, the kind of viruses that are being used to undermine right. uh, our security, uh, then we are going to ultimately lose this war in cyber, We're, we'll lose right. it. The other, the other part of this, very frankly, is not just good defense, but good offense. I mean, the reality is uh, when Russia was attacking the United States as they were during our elections, I, for the life of me, do not understand why we did not aggressively go after Russia right. using cyber to make clear to them that we can do greater damage to them than they're trying to do to us. We had to send them a message and that message was never sent. Absolutely. So if we're going to deal with the kind of cyber threats we're facing now, which have multiplied a number of times since I was there. I mean, what, what you're seeing uh, Russia do, Iran do, North Korea do, uh, China do, uh, when it comes to uh, cyber technology uh, is incredibly advanced. China is developing this capability probably faster than anybody. 
Right. And if we don't get ahead of that curve, if we don't develop the kind of capability to be able to defend ourselves, make no mistake about it. You don't need to send an F-14 fighter. You don't need to send a bomber. You can just sit at a computer and paralyze our country. That's a reality. Right. Yeah. And we have got to be ready to deal with it. And we're not. No, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, you know, one of the one of the crazy things you know, you hear about what, what the Russians did in 2016, and we now have seen a report from ODNI just yesterday uh, talking about what the Russians did um, in 2020. In 2018, we've now declassified the fact that we engaged in some activities against at least the Internet Research Agency, right? The ones who generate some of these uh, some of this activity. But what's crazy is what we appear to have done is conducted a, a low level, you know, denial of service attack. It's almost like the 1980s called and want their want their cyber attack back, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not designed to extract costs the way you described. It's not designed to uh, extract real pain of the kind that if you hit us, we're gonna hit you back, you know? It's uh it's it's like the, the kid on the playground. I know uh, as parents, we all want to tell our kids, you know, tell the teacher and they'll come and deal with us, right? But the truth is the most effective thing in the international arena with the bully is. You punch them in the face, everybody can see it, right? They're not going to bother you anymore. And unfortunately, we have not yet been prepared to do that. Um, and, and I, and I worry right. about that. Um, well, so so uh, so on, on China, right? We see China doing all sorts of stuff, as you point out, uh, in the cyber domain, but beyond, well beyond. You, you mentioned the South China Sea. Uh, you mentioned Hong Kong. But I want to pick up on one part that you talked about, which I don't think a lot of people are paying attention to, which is Taiwan, right? A huge amount of our... Uh, semiconductor chips come out of Taiwan um, and Japan, uh, but, but Taiwan in a very significant way, uh, a lot of other goods we get from, from that part of the world come out of Taiwan. Um, how real is the threat to Taiwan? Historically, I think we've always thought that, that the Chinese would never cross the Taiwan Strait because America was there and America sort of implicitly said, we will back Taiwan. And every time China was threatening, we'd sail a carrier battle group to the Taiwan Strait to just make the point, we're here and we're watching. But China's been getting a lot more aggressive, a lot more overflights of Taiwan, a lot more sort of threatening statements. Should we be, I mean, is that a real thing that we should be worried about? Is there the potential the Chinese may come across the Taiwan Strait and, 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 and come after what, what they believe and what we have told them, at least at some level since Nixon, uh, is part of their country? The, the worst thing we have done in dealing with China and for that matter, in dealing with Russia is that we have emboldened them by virtue of showing weakness. Uh, you know, when the United States failed to respond uh, to what Putin did uh, in the Crimea and the Ukraine, uh, and when, uh, you know, we, it was clear we were not going to confront them, uh, they obviously took advantage of that to go into Syria established a base in Syria. They've gone into the Middle East uh, and they've conducted these attacks we've seen against the United States, uh, bold attacks that have been conducted against the United States. And to a large extent, China, seeing the weakness of the United States, I mean, we pulled out of the T TTP, uh, which was a trade agreement, frankly, that we should have maintained in order to build a trade base that would compete with China. We walked right. away from that. Right. Uh, we walked away from a lot of our uh, responsibilities and China read weakness into the United States. And so it has emboldened them. Uh, and they have become much more aggressive in using their diplomacy, in using their economy, in using their ability to try to influence others. And what I think needs to be done with Russia and with China is that you've got to make very clear to them the lines that they cannot cross. Right. You've got to make clear that there are certain things we will not allow them to do. You know, we'll not allow uh, Russia to go after former uh, Soviet Union uh, nations to be to, to, that that are now part of NATO. Right. Uh, we're not going to allow that to happen. Period. Uh, we're not going to allow China uh, to uh, to invade Taiwan and to undermine their independence. You know, that, that's, pretty imp that's a very important signal right. to make clear to China. We're not gonna let you do this. Now, I think frankly, if China understands that we're serious about that. Right, they won't do it. 
I, I, China's not going to do that. They're right. not. They're, right. You know, they may be a lot of things. They're not dumb. Right. But they don't think we're not serious. Do they so, don't think we're serious. They've got to get that signal that the United States uh, is a player in the Pacific. We are a power in the Pacific. Yes, we're going to deploy our forces in the Pacific. I once had a conversation with President Xi, who was who was uh, criticizing the fact that we were going to rebalance some of our fleet to the Pacific. And I said, you know, Mr. President, we are a Pacific power, just like right. you are a Pacific power. And we can either work together to deal with the threats that we all confront, or we are going to operate separately. But we right. are a power in the Pacific because that is a reality. And you're going to have to deal with that reality. And we either work together to confront these yeah. threats, whether it's North Korea, whether it's freedom of, freedom of the seas, whether it's dealing with uh, trade. We, we either do this together or we're going to confront each other. Right. Make exactly. no mistake about it. I, you know, if you say those things to the Chinese, then they'll understand, you know, where the United States stands. Right. And you can then, frankly, create some room for a dialogue right. because then you can try to get some things accomplished. Right. But unless you draw those lines, unless you say, look, you cannot militarize these islands in the South China Sea, you cannot violate international laws with regards to freedom of the seas. Right. We're not going to allow you to do that. We're going to continue to send our ships through the South China Sea. Understand that that is allowed by international law. You know, if you say that clearly and make it clear through our actions, you want to talk with the Chinese? Fine. You want to have that dialogue with the Chinese? Fine. But you have to do it from strength. Right. Well, and that's and that and that last piece is exactly the point. It it it, it seems to be the case that the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, the North Koreans, even they smell weakness, right? They see they they perceive, whether rightly or wrongly, that the American people are weary of war. That in a lot of ways, Iraq was a modern version of Vietnam for us. Uh, that Afghanistan, the long war in Afghanistan, has been similar to us. Um, and that and they don't see leadership in the United States at the highest levels, certainly in members of Congress, uh, and, and, and I would say probably majorities in Congress, unfortunately, uh, but also out of the Office of Presidency. They don't see a willingness, uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the current president because he hasn't been in long enough, but certainly, you know, uh, it, 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 they perceive that about President Obama, rightly or wrongly. They certainly perceive that about President Trump, rightly or wrongly, um, in part because we haven't always drawn clear lines. And when we have drawn clear lines, we haven't always enforced them. We haven't lived up to what we say we're going to do. And so you can't really fault them for saying, well, you know, you said you might do this. You, you seem really concerned about Ukraine, and yet you did nothing. You seem really concerned about chemical weapons in Syria, yet you did nothing. You talked a big game on North Korea, President Trump, and you got no deal out of them. In fact, they, you, they almost bamboozled you into a much worse deal. Um, you know, it, it, it it seems to me that one of the challenges we face in the world is that we haven't really built our reputation on being, you know, a fierce ally um, or a very bold enemy. Uh, we've sort of seemed yeah. a little milquetoast and concerned about coming home. Jamil, I, I think one of the one of the problems, and, and I, I've seen this for a while. Uh, you know, it, in the Clinton administration, one of the one of the things we did was actually put together a comprehensive national security strategy mm. for, for the country that identified where our national security interests were yeah. uh, and how we, would, how we would respond if those national security interests were threatened. Uh, a comprehensive strategy. Uh, and for, for a lot of reasons, recent administrations just haven't wanted to sit down and develop that kind of comprehensive strategy because they feel that, you know, it, it, it in some ways limits them in their ability to respond uh, to that uh, more immediate crisis. Well, what happens is that we wind up then simply responding to crisis rather than getting ahead of crisis. Right. And when you do that, then uh, you have to respond to that crisis 
you deploy forces to deal with a particular crisis. And then when you don't have the clarity of mission as to why the hell you're there, what is victory? What is achieving your mission? And when is it, when is it time to get out? It gets muddled. Yeah. And then everybody gets a little confused about why are we doing that? Right. So we need to sit down and I, and I would certainly urge President Biden to do this. And he's got some good people uh, in Tony Blinken and uh, uh, in the Secretary of Defense to, to, to just sit down and, and really put a comprehensive national strategy together that defines right. our national security interests, that says, you know, where the lines are for the United States uh, and makes clear that, you know, what our approach is going to be if we're threatened by North Korea, if we're threatened by Russia, if we're threatened by China, if we're threatened by Iran, makes clear what the United States considers the national security interests that will mobilize us and take us uh, into action if necessary. Right. No, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I know we've got about 150 people in the audience, um, and I see they've already put some questions in the question and answer box. So for those of you folks who have questions, uh, please do put them in the Q and A box. We'll try to get to all of them. We'll actually get started with your questions here in just a few minutes. Um, but in the in the few minutes I have left for my session, my my part of this section, um, I want to I want to just ask, and I, and I hate to, I, I know I know we should be talking about the issues, but I, I would just love for you to, to to take a moment, tell us about what it was like. Uh, as you learned, you came into the you came into the CIA director. You learned that we had potential intelligence on where Osama bin Laden was. Uh, you made some tough choices about about what to do to collect additional intelligence stuff that you can't talk about to figure out whether it was in fact bin Laden. Um, uh, and there have been all sorts of leaks, but we won't talk about that. Um, and then and then you had operational control with with these JSOC forces chopped to CIA, uh, and, and you were in the seat making the call. Uh, talk to us about about the lead up to that that moment, what it was like in that in in the room in the command center, you know, and, and seeing the helicopter go down and and and, war and wondering whether this was sort of you know your 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 desert one moment. I mean, I can't even imagine. So, can you just give the audience a sense of like what what the lead up, what that moment was like? Uh, well, you know, th thank you for the question. I mean, I, it it without question, it's one of the proudest. Uh, uh, operations that I had the uh, honor to be a part of. Uh, you know, the president made clear that uh, it was important we go after uh, bin Laden. Uh, I remember talking to the CIA and saying, you know, where are we? And I had different people say, well, we're not sure where he is. We haven't had any leads. We don't know whether he's living in a cave or whether he's living in Iran or whether he's dead. Uh, we don't know. Uh, and I said, well, you know, that's, that's not satisfactory. Uh, we've We've got to put together an effort that focuses on nothing else uh, and assign people uh, at the CIA to do that. And they did uh, to their credit. Uh, and they developed a number of different approaches to trying to pin down uh, you know, where bin Laden uh, in fact could be. And it was the result of uh, you know, intelligence that we were able to gather that uh, identified the couriers uh, to bin Laden, which was a key. Uh, and then we put faces to those couriers. And we actually then located them uh, in a town called Peshawar in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and through surveillance, followed them to the compound in Obadabad. And when they got to the compound, uh, the lights went off because the compound was about three times as big as any other compound, had 18 foot walls on one side, 12 foot walls on another side. It had an eight foot wall on the third floor. Now, Abbottabad's a place where people like to look at the mountains. Why the hell would you have a wall on the third floor? Uh, and the people that were there uh, had uh, used tremendous security. They wouldn't make a phone call unless they went 90 miles away. So we, we began to do surveillance. We saw, uh, we you looked at the clothes and the clothesline and located, decided that there was a family similar to the bin Laden family that was living on the third floor of this compound. Right. Uh, and after I reported uh, the finding of the compound uh, and our suspicions to the president, uh, he said, you know, we had to continue to conduct uh, surveillance, which we did uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and uh, 
you know, we continued to try to see if we could find Bin Laden. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you one moment. We, we, we noticed that there was somebody who, who looked like an, uh, an older gentleman who would come out of the compound, walk in circles in the middle of that compound, uh, and then immediately go back inside. And I remember saying to the CIA, I said, for, for goodness sakes, give me a telescope, give me a camera. I need to get a facial ID on who this is. It could very well be Bin Laden. They right. said, you know, we just, the walls are in the way. We've got these 12 foot walls. We, we just can't get a good, uh, good shot. And I remember saying to them, look, I've seen movies where the CIA can do this, Dan. Right, right. <laughs> and they, you know, they smiled, but uh, they knew it was still tough to do. So after we spent a, about a number of months uh, gathering information, uh, and uh, it, it was at that point uh, the president said, "I, you know, he was worried about leaks, and so he said we have to put an operation together." I got together with Bill McRaven. Uh, Admiral McRaven, who was head of special forces uh, at, the, at the time, and just, you know, he was just terrific, uh, you know, was excited about the opportunity uh, and uh, recommended that we uh, we do a commando raid, essentially with SEALs uh, right. going in uh, to go after the compound. Uh, we brought it to uh, the White House and the National Security Council meeting, uh, and the president asked, uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, should we do this operation? It was risky. There's no question. It was risky. We didn't have 100% information on bin Laden, but uh, but we, you know, I, I felt that it, it was important to conduct this mission because of the information we had. Uh, and he went around uh, the people in the National Security Council, and a lot of people who I respect uh, raised questions because it was risky. I don't I don't disagree with them in the sense of not understanding why they did it. A lot of them had lived through the Carter years with the right. helicopters that went down in Iran. So right. they were nervous about uh, that operation. Uh, but in the end, when the president asked me, I said, you know, Mr. President, uh, I've had an old formula I've used uh, when I was in Congress, when I faced a tough decision, which is pretend you ask an average citizen in your district, if you knew what I knew about this issue, what would you do? And I said, if I told the average citizen of my district we had the best information on the location of bin Laden since Tora Bora, I think they'd say right. you have to do this. And that's what I'm saying to you, Mr. President, you have to do it. He didn't make a decision then, but the next morning he did. Uh, and we had already deployed uh, the forces there to, uh, uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, and we followed that mission uh, that night, uh, followed the uh, helicopters in, as you, as you pointed out, uh, one of the helicopters, when it got over the compound, because it had been hot that day, the engine stalled. And thank God there was a great warrant officer who brought that helicopter down. Uh, the tail was on one of the walls. But uh, I remember asking Bill McRaven, what the hell's happening, Bill? Right. You know, that moment when you think it's, a, oh, man, you know, it's going to hell. And Bill McRaven didn't miss a beat. He said, no, no, I've got... Uh, backup helicopters coming in. We're gonna continue with the mission. We're gonna breach the walls. We're gonna do this. I said, God bless you, let's do it. And he did. Uh, and uh, you know, there was, you could hear some uh, gunfire. Uh, and then there was about 15 minutes of silence, the longest 15 minutes of my life. And then uh, they came back and I think it was Bill McRaven who said, uh, I think we have a Geronimo, which was the code word for getting bin Laden. And a few minutes later he said, we have a Geronimo, which meant that uh, we got bin Laden. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, they came back. Uh, and I remember when we went to the White House that night and the president made the announcement, people were gathering outside uh, of the White House yelling, USA, USA, CIA, CIA. Yeah. I was there. I never thought I would ever hear. But, yeah. it, but it was, you know, we sent a message to the world that nobody attacks our country and gets away with it. And I, I think that was a necessary message that had to Absolutely. be said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, what an amazing story. Um, I, you know, I mean, we could we could go on with this for hours, but we have questions <laughs> to the audience. I see almost 20 questions from our, our over 100, almost 150 people in the room. So uh, we'll start with somebody you may remember from, from the intelligence committee, Paula Doyle, who has three points and a question, she says. Uh, she says um, 
One, she's concerned about the repositioning of Russian forces in eastern Ukraine, Crimea, Syria, uh, you know, the Iranian repositioning of their forces and proxies, frankly, in Iraq, Syria and the like. Uh, I've put U.S. and military personnel, uh, intelligence personnel in harm's way for many years. We've also seen Russia, China, Iran, North Korea extract very expensive cyber-based advantages uh, here in the U.S. DOJ has done hardly anything about it. They've indicted a few folks in a name and shame strategy. We have some sanctions in place. Not a lot's happened there. Um, and then, of course, Russia and China, and China in particular, has stolen a huge amount of personally identifiable information from people in the U.S. We know about the Anthem hacks, the uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the credit rating agency, uh, you know, um, I mean, you name it, uh, they've got a ton of data um, and, and nothing prevents them from weaponizing this data or feeding it into uh, AI algorithms to, uh, to make them more, more performant. Um, Paul's question after all these circumstances is how can DOD state and the IC organize right away, she says that in all caps, right away, uh, against this this troubling combination of circumstances, positioning of forces in in the Middle East and the region, uh, the the cyber based attacks and and uh, and and the huge theft and hacking of our of our personal identifiable information. Well, I, she obviously uh, because of her intelligence background has uh, you know has pretty effectively pulled together some of the uh, concerns uh, that uh, that are out there, and uh, they're real concerns uh, about what has happened and. Uh, you know, hi hybrid war, which is uh, what Russia basically introduced in uh, in the Crimea and Ukraine, uh, they've used that tactic of combining cyber plus proxy forces uh, to be able to expand their influence. And we have not countered that, very frankly. We haven't found a way to counter that. Uh, mm -hmm. And nor have we developed, frankly, the capability to develop a hybrid, hybrid war ourselves, which I think is something we're going to have to do. Uh, if we're going to be uh, protecting our security in the future. Uh, look, I, I, think, I think it is very important for DOD and our intelligence agencies uh, to sit down uh, and to get a full intelligence report on the, on the potential threats that are out there. And to have DOD, I mean, if there's one thing DOD does well, it's develop plans or how you respond to the threats that are out there. That's what we do, and that's what right. we've done. Uh, and I think that the president ought to direct both the intelligence and DOD to sit down and do a thorough analysis of the threats that are out there today uh, and to get from DOD plans as to how we will respond uh, if necessary to those threats. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Um... It, it is it is a it is a deep and I think enduring challenge to to, to bring together these elements of our of our of our national security apparatus to really confront these these challenges. Um, Harold Moss, one of our visiting fellows uh, at NSI, asks um, uh, that you recently called for a virtual panel, uh, sort of a 9/11 style panel, uh, relative to the recent insurrection. Uh, can you talk to us about your view about the threat of domestic uh, extremists and how we should deal with this type of domestic threat? Yeah, look, uh, as I said, 9-11 uh, was a wake-up call to foreign terrorism. Uh, you know, up to that point, we had, you know, we followed terrorists. We you know, looked at bin Laden. We looked at others. Uh, I don't think we ever anticipated what happened uh, in terms of their attack on this country. Uh, so it was a wake-up call, and we went to war as a result of that. January 6th is a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call when you have a mob of extremists attack the United States Capitol, take over the United States Capitol, something I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see. Right. I never thought I would see anything like that. Uh, and, and mark my word, there are a lot of failings here. I mean, not to have acted to, to provide the security necessary to protect the Capitol was a major failing. A major failing. I mean, for God's sakes, I was sitting at home looking at that that mob when they were, uh, you know, there uh, in the mall, and saying to myself, "For God's sakes, surround the Capitol right. and make sure that that mob doesn't attack the Capitol." And then when the the cameras focused on the Capitol and there was no there was no arm and arm protection for the Capitol, I said, "This is outrageous." And so, yeah. I, look. Uh, Domestic terrorism is a threat. 
Uh, we know what uh, white supremacist groups and with other conspiratorial groups are all saying and doing and organizing. We, we've seen the threat. Uh, we, we have to do exactly what we did in dealing with Al Qaeda in the sense that we have to develop very intensive intelligence capabilities to target these groups uh, and make sure that we know exactly what they're up to and exactly what they're doing. Right. That's, that's the first order of business is you've got to find out what the hell they're up to. You yeah. can't wait for them to attack and then respond. You've got to, you've got to go at them before they attack uh, in order to protect our country. So improving our intelligence capability to go after these groups, number one. Number two, improving law enforcement's capability of responding to these groups, to be able to monitor them, to be able to follow what they're doing, and to be able to make sure that we are able to act before they do further damage to our democracy. Right. And that requires the FBI, which obviously is our primary law enforcement uh, group in this country at the federal level. Uh, the FBI have to provide that information, that training, that capability to both state and local law enforcement uh, authorities so that they are prepared to deal with this potential threat. We have to make a pledge that what happened on January 6th will never happen again in this country. And if we make that pledge and commit ourselves, then I think you know we can do what we did with 9-11, which is to make sure that our country did not suffer another attack. Uh, as no, well. I, I, absolutely. I mean, I again, as you said, I, I can't. I, it, before it happened, I couldn't even imagine that Americans would engage. I mean, the the fact that the last time the Capitol was under that kind of threat was on 9/11 when Al Qaeda threatened to fly planes into that building, right? And and to have Americans stand there and think that that is an appropriate way to behave, and and that and that and let's just be candid, right? You don't have to say it; I'll say it. The fact that the president from the White House essentially called for what happened that day. And it, it, if not called for it, certainly followed up with, with referring to people that were involved as, 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 as whatever, whatever ridiculous term he used. It's, it's outrageous and appalling um, and, and, a, and, a real, and a real lesson to all those of us who, who watch from the outside. Um, you know, one of the things I want to ask about that, and one of our questioners, Audrey Adams, asked about uh, what lessons we can take from fighting terrorism of our seas and applying them to this domestic violence problem. Um, but I want to ask sort of a variant of Audrey's question. Uh, that, that's her question. My question, which is related, is how do we need to be careful here, right? We talk about using intelligence tools and, and surveillance uh, of white supremacist groups. And, and of course, we need to know what they're up to. But we've seen a history in this country, right? It was not, wasn't so long ago in the 60s, the surveillance of, of groups that we thought were associated with communists and, and Joan Baez and Martin Luther King and the surveillance yeah. of, of the Black Panthers. And and you can see these tools potentially being turned against, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whatever you think about that movement, or whatever you think about 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 uh, about Antifa, whatever you think about about white supremacist groups, and, and maybe and maybe it's not fair to compare one to the other, right? But we can see these tools being utilized against groups that today may be disfavored, but the next month might be disfavored in a different way, right? How do we ensure that we you, we have tools that are used wisely that we can have the right kind of oversight so that we don't go too far? People call it for a domestic terrorism law. Is that something that we should? do given our history with the use of national security tools in ways that I don't think the American people necessarily have always been proud of? Well, you know, I, I, I'm often asked the question about, uh, you know, this uh, choice between uh, security and our freedoms. Uh, and and le let me just make clear, at least in, in my experience, uh, in, where I've been at, at CIA and, and at DOD and, uh, you know, in, in the, the efforts that I've conducted even when I, when I was uh, as chief of staff to the president. I don't think this country has to make a choice between protecting our security and protecting our freedoms. I don't. Now, having said that, if you're, if you're going to do this right, what it requires is a great deal of transparency and a great deal of congressional oversight. Uh, in the operations I did as CIA director, uh, I went to the intelligence committees, both the House and the Senate, and I reported every one of those operations to them and what we were doing. Yeah. And if they had any concerns, if they had any objections, they registered them at that point. Uh, but 
if they most of the time I had full support from them to conduct those operations uh, because they knew we were going after uh, people who had threatened our country. Right. Uh, what you have to do is to make sure. I mean, I, I'm not so sure that you have to develop uh, new laws because that's always, uh, you know, a ripe area for abuse every time you try to do that. And sometimes the Congress loves to pass new laws because it makes them look like they're doing something doing about something, right. it, only right. to create more trouble in the end. Right. Uh, so I'm not so sure you have to do that. But you do have to make damn sure that the committees in Congress are doing effective oversight over just exactly what is being done to conduct intelligence, to conduct operations against domestic terrorists, uh, and that they're kept informed. Uh, and that when it comes to certain requirements uh, that may involve the courts uh, and may involve the kind of legal procedures that are required, uh, those have to be done. They have to, right. I mean, you have to prove that you can, you know, you get your search warrants. You have to prove that, uh, you know, you're, you're able to go after the kind of information that you may need. Uh, and also, let me also add, there has to be a partnership here between the public and private sector. Uh, I had a strong relationship with people in Silicon Valley, uh, but it was confidential. I didn't tell a damn person what that right. relationship was about. Uh, and, and yet they were, they were, you know, they were working with us when it came to the threats that we were confronting, they worked with us. You've got to have that kind of relationship. Uh, it, do, it doesn't mean that you have to tell the world everything. It doesn't mean you've got to, you know, uh, to, uh, not hold uh, confidences uh, in, in terms of working with these uh, areas, but you, we are all Americans. We all care about this country and right. we all want to protect this country from those who want to do our democracy harm. Uh, we've got to have, we've got to operate in that spirit in order to be able to protect our country. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah, I want to note, by the way, a, a few members of our advisory board that are here in the audience. I see Tish Long, the former director of NGA, the first female head of a major big six intelligence agency, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Attorney General Michael Mukasey, former, former district court judge and chief judge of Southern District of New York. Um, and, uh, and a number of other folks. And I know there's a number of guests here that I can't see their names, unfortunately, uh, but I see they're here, uh, they're here with us also. Uh, so thank you all for, uh, for being here. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I want to ask a question from Gentry Lane, um, one of our visiting fellows who asked about, uh, about cyber conflict, um, since we talked a little about that earlier. Um, you know, she knows that Boris Johnson just came out and, and talked about the US, the UK taking a full spectrum re uh, response to cyber conflict. And uh, she mentions that, the U.S. seems to, unfortunately, in, in many ways, to accept that we're going to go offensive, seems to be fighting cyber with cyber, a constraint we don't apply in any other warfighting domain. Um, is that a mistake? Should we should we really go real full spectrum? I mean, you, we talk about we talk about indictments, you know, and we talk about other things, but when it comes to offensive activities, it seems to be in cyber we tend to just use cyber. Is that is that is that a mistake? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't I don't I don't, I don't think. Uh, I don't think we ought to limit ourselves uh, because, as I said, you can now you 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 now have the development of these sophisticated viruses, which, if deployed in these key computers that run our country, for God's sakes, yeah, it it would not take long to basically uh, paralyze our electric grid system in this country paralyze our chemical systems, our water systems, our financial systems, our government systems. You could literally, by destroying those computers, paralyze our country. Uh, and I think when, when those kinds of attacks take place, the United States has to respond. Now, I know that you know, we have really not developed what is an act of war when it comes to a cyber attack. We yeah. haven't really defined that. Uh, but I think we do need to take the time to be able to define uh, what constitutes an attack against our national security when it comes to cyber, so that we are permitted not just to respond uh, in cyber, 
but can respond in other ways to send a clear message that we are doing everything necessary to protect our country. That has to be the approach we take in this arena. Yeah. yeah. One of our guests, uh, Arthur Reiser, um, who's a faculty member here at, at, at NSI, um, uh, taught, wants to talk about China. Um, and he notes that he served in Iraq, Fallujah in 05 and 06. Um, his son is an army infantryman and his wife is in the army JAG Corps. Um, how prepared should we be for, should be, should be with, how prepared should we be for a kinetic war with China? Uh, or maybe another way of asking, he says, is how scared should we be? Is that a real uh, thing? A kinetic war with China? Well, uh, look, I, for, from my own experience, uh, you know, working with companies in Silicon Valley, uh, every one of them believes that China is far ahead of us in terms of uh, technology related to uh, cyber. Uh, certainly, they're operating ahead of us uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, they're operating ahead of us in terms of uh, development of uh, new technologies. Uh, there, there's not much question in my mind that China is going full speed ahead to try to develop these capabilities. Uh, and the consequence is that if we do not invest in the same capabilities, and I, I think we've dropped the ball, frankly, in terms of funding for new technologies in this country. Uh, we have got to invest in cyber. We've got to invest in artificial intelligence. We've got to invest in cutting edge technology. Right. That is the future. Uh, and if we continue to fall behind, make no mistake about it. You talk ab about emboldening our adversaries. That's exactly what you will do. Because yeah. if they think they can attack us and have an advantage over us by virtue of that, uh, we have to make clear that that temptation should not exist. And the only way you do that is by preparing ourselves to be able to develop that kind of technological capability. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we, we're, we're, we have three minutes left and so I'll get, take one more question from the audience then we'll wrap up and I wanna end on time and be respectful of your time, sir. So our last question, uh, and I apologize to all the people, there are 23 questions that are not gonna get answered, unfortunately. <laughs> but our last question will come at you from Tish Long. Um, who asks, uh, thanks you for your service and your continued involvement in our national security affairs. And she's interested, and now remember, former director of NGA, um, she wants to know your views on the US Space Force and where their focus should be besides protecting our satellites and our collection capabilities. <laughs> she did, I added that last part to be fair. I didn't, I did not, she did not ask that yeah, part. But yeah, yeah what, what, mean, do you, what do you think about the US Space Force? I, you know, I, I always get, uh, I get very worried when you build a new bureaucracy <laughs> to deal with the problems that we have. Uh, and, and even though I, I kind of, you know, understand that it helps us focus a little, little better perhaps. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to at least give them the opportunity to show me I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm wrong. Right. Uh, because I mean, and I've been through this. I think you know we went through it with Homeland Security constructing. Yeah. Homeland Still going security. through with Homeland Security. It's uh, you know we, we built Homeland Security as a response to 9/11, uh, and it suddenly became a bureaucracy in which there were a number of agencies that didn't relate to one another. They were all operating in their own area. They couldn't come together, and eventually they have. I, I mean, I give I give credit to the secretaries that have had to to, to deal with that, but it took a long time. It took a long time. For homeland security to make sense to me uh and the same thing is true for other bureaucracies that we we suddenly develop as an answer to something so i i'm i'm a little bit uh, cynical about uh, uh the space uh, cadets the space group here uh right. but but i'm willing to give them uh, the room to prove prove me wrong uh i do think that it is essential that we focus on space china is focusing on space russia is focusing on space the capabilities of the kind of weaponry you can develop in space could really undermine our national security in a second. Uh, and if we, aren't, if we aren't ahead of the curve uh, in developing uh, space capabilities, 
uh, and uh, making sure that we're protected uh, in space, uh, then I think uh, we're going to suddenly find ourselves uh, we're going to suddenly find ourselves captured by our yeah. own inability to have uh, maintained our space capabilities uh, in, in, yeah. in outer space. So uh, bottom line is, yes, we have to focus on space. Yes, we have to develop new capabilities. Yes, we have to be able to uh, make sure that the United States uh, is, uh, is investing uh, in, in that area. Uh, and, you know, if, uh, if the if the space uh, I'm not sure what what are they called space space force space force if space force can help uh, then fine but you know what uh, regardless of whether or not we have a space force we should do this job we yeah. got to do it and whether it's NGA or whether it's uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, the the groups that are involved with space exploration, yeah. uh, one one way or another, we need to stay ahead in space. Agreed. Well, look, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for taking this time. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, it's just it's such a thrill to be talking to you and 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 to hear your thoughts on this stuff. Um, for folks in the audience, uh, keep an eye out for NASA Nightcap next month. Uh, keep an eye out for our new law and policy papers up on our website. China is China naval aggression, decoding deep fakes, pandemics, the intel community. Also check out our new blog, theskiff.com. Find us on LinkedIn, Twitter at Mason Natsek, and our three amazing podcast fault lines, which is Republicans and Democrats talking about national security, Iron Butterfly featuring the stories of women uh, in, in intelligence and national security, and NSI Live, all of our events. Mr. Secretary, I, I can't thank you enough. What an amazing event. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank, thank you, you for being here. Everybody have a terrific night. Thank you, and uh, my thanks to everybody. I really appreciate it. The opportunity and it's good to be with you. Good to have you, sir.